They are pieces that basically teach you about engineering done the hard way, where you had to do it and fight with physics and electronics. The, the more clunky and over-engineered it is, the better. I'm Marc Verdiel, and I collect and restore early computers, and also I have a particular liking for Hewlett Packard computers and test equipment, dinosaurs, as they all call them. I would have all together maybe 100 pieces. and professional stuff, there's almost no consumer stuff. I just hate it. So it goes from you know, 50 pounds to 800 pounds. There are some that you know, we need four to six people to move them down the basement. <laughs> so compared to today, uh, technology, they solve the problem the hard way, but what they do is exceptional. Still holds, you know, holds a candle to modern equipment. The point is to revive those machines and to make them all work as they were when they were new, and also to have them interact, work together. I was thinking of building a, a robot just for fun, and I saw this guy that had made a full-size R2-D2, and I say, oh, that's it. Hello, R2. I have a PhD in optical electronics, and I have done fiber optics telecommunication for my uh, whole career. And one of my companies was bought by Intel, which was great because I always loved computers. Progressively, I have uh, went from a you know, scientist to an engineer to a business person, and they don't let me turn the knobs in the lab anymore. And this is this is the outlet for my uh, my engineering passion. And this one has uh, two spiders inside. I try to limit myself uh, to things that I know I will be able to repair. If it's not repaired, at least it's clean and in storage on, on, on display. No cardboard, I clean my cables, for example. Nobody else does that, right? Uh, we should get some of you know, the other restorers annoyed, of course, because I go overboard. I'm, I'm a perfectionist, in case you <laughs> I didn't figure that out yet. <laughs> And then there's a very large research phase. So then you have to figure out you know, how are we going to attack it. And that's really the joy, because then you get into the skin of the people that did those incredible engineering efforts. And uh, you kind of relive their problems and see how they solved it. Most of those, you open them up and uh, you're just amazed at the amount of hardware that's in it. It's so amazing, it's almost art. So usually at the end, when I've restored an HP computer, it goes and you know, drives some kind of crazy uh, test setup. Sometimes we do something completely silly and completely anachronistic. We have an old computer uh, crack a Bitcoin, or I have my uh, HP plotters draw some anime. The favorite one is the one I am currently restoring. The Xerox Alto is such an outstanding machine. It was made in the 70s when there were no microprocessors. The Alto basically invented everything that's in a modern computer. It has a graphic screen, uh, it looks like Word, you can draw on it. It has a mouse. It's a computer for which Ethernet was invented, for which the laser printer was invented. And, and this thing is so far ahead, it's like 20 years ahead of uh, when it would actually become commercial. It's just mind-boggling. It's a baby Mac. Everything that this machine does, <laughs> you find on the Mac later. Straight, how it works. This one, find out which components on the port work. So, in the same day, I might be at a computer history museum repairing a 1950s supercomputer, and in the afternoon, I might be at work, and I might work on the fastest, meanest supercomputer of today. And I think what is striking in computing is that the principles haven't changed a bit. So we're always uh, humbled. These are selected computers that have uh, advanced the state of the art in one way or another. Mechanical and electrical engineering that do art, just by mistake almost, by, <laughs> by accident. Accidental engineering art. <laughs>